Chapter 15. Peden. M. Otat Uzlik with sweat. I sit down in the seat beside Tila and smooth out the skirt of my dress, if only for an excuse to wipe my sweaty hands on the smooth silk. I look up into the audience, and my breath catches. I'm embarrassed that I hadn't observed them before, but now I can't seem to tear my eyes away. The King and Queen and Kit. They stare down at me from their snug, glass box. The king and his heir sit close together, their similarities striking me like a blow to the chest. Their sandy hair and emerald eyes mirror one another, looking so alike that my hatred for one begins to bleed into the other. So, Peden, tell us about your incident with Prince Kai. My eyes trail back to Telus, nearly blinded by her gleaming white teeth and vibrant hair. She leans towards me and places a soft hand on my shoulder, projecting my voice for all to hear. Well, according to Prince Kai, there's not much to tell. But if you ask me, I think is a little embarrassed that a girl from the slums had to come to his rescue. The words tumble out of my mouth before I can stop them. Plagues, I need the people to like me and mocking their prince is probably not the best way to. Laughter. To my surprise, and saving grace, the audience finds me amusing. I peek over my shoulder at Kai and watch the ghost of a smile grace his features. So, maybe I can bash their prince after all. I can work with that. Not afraid to tell it like it is. Tila laughs softly before moving on to the next question, the one I'm sure many are wondering. So, tell us again how is it that you were able to fight off the silencer? I mean, it's clear you can hold your own in a physical fight, but how come the silencer didn't affect you? I take a deep breath, knowing that this detail is very important for everyone to understand, to believe. Well, Tila, I'm a psychic. It's a mental ability that allows me to sense strong emotions from others and get flashes of information. And because of that, I have the power to guard my head, keep it safe from people like the silencers. I smile slightly before adding, and apparently, people like Prince Kai, since he can't use or sense my small ability. How fascinating. I must say, I've never met a psychic before. Her eyes are wide, looking very intrigued with me, as I'm sure the rest of the crowd is. Yes, well, despite it being a mundane ability, it does seem to be quite rare. I smile brightly as if I'm not lying through the teeth I'm f flashing at her. All right, Peden, tell us about your life in that, she stutters, almost saying slums before choosing to say, in Ilya. I contemplate lying some more, saying how it wasn't that bad, how it was easy living in the slums. But it seems I suddenly have the urge to be honest. You mean, life in the slums? She blinks at me, surprised by my blunt correction. There's not much to tell. Life on the streets isn't much of a life at all. I look her right in the eyes before turning to face the hushed crowd. These past few years, hunger and cold have been the only constant in my life but it's not just me. There are dozens of others who sleep on the same hard cobblestone I did. Dozens of others who will do anything for a single shilling. I pause and take a breath. Living in the slums is survival of the fittest. So, in a way, I'm more prepared for these trials than anyone. Tila stares at me in shock, clearly not expecting that answer. Then something like pity gleams in her brown eyes. I hate it. I don't want her or the crowd's pity. I want change. She quickly moves on to more light-hearted questions about training and my fellow contestants. Who do you think will be your biggest competition? Hum. I tuck a strand of hair behind my ear, contemplating my answer. Perhaps Prince Kai, seeing that he has the ability to use any power, Tila offers. Not mine, remember. I laugh lightly and so does she. He won't be a problem. In fact, We'll see how far he makes it in these trials without me there to save him. I smile sweetly as the crowd roars with laughter, practically feeling Kai's eyes burning a hole into the back of my head. All right, Peden, last question. What do you expect to get out of the trials? My mouth opens, intending to spew out the practiced motto of the purging trials like everyone else had. Like I'm supposed to do. But... When my eyes lock on the glass box above me, lock on the current and expected king, words fall out of my mouth before I can bite my tongue.
The wrong words. Survival. I expect to survive this. I can feel thousands of eyes pinned on me. Teela manages a slow blink while wisps of teal hair blow across her face in the soft breeze. Finally, she clears her throat and stands stiffly to guide me down the stage. All right then, she tries to act natural as she says, show us what you can do. Now I'm blinking at her. How the hell am I supposed to do that? Um, I look around the stadium as I say, why don't you chose a random person from the crowd, and I'll... I'll read them. What the plagues am I talking about? Teela smiles and nods, clearly happy to go do something. I watch as she climbs the steps out of the pit and begins walking down the rows of people, smiling and waving as she goes. After a few minutes of contemplation, she finally points to a young girl seated a few rows above. The poor girl looks concerningly confused but cautiously stands before making her way down into the pit, guided by Teela. When she approaches me wearily, I realize she can't be much older than I am. Her short brown hair paired with the freckles splattering her face grant her a constant look of innocence. I smile and reach out to take her hands, wanting to make a show of this. Don't worry, I won't bite, I say softly when she takes a slight step back. I offer her what I hope is a warm smile, and with that, she slowly holds her tan hands out to me. Grasping them gently in my own, I quickly observe her before squeezing my eyes shut. I have everything I need. I think of the tarnished chain around her neck, paired with the faded, large ring hanging from it that was just barely visible behind the folds of her shirt. I'd kept my father's ring after he died too, only I wear mine on my thumb. I'm sensing, grief. You, I squeeze her warm hands, taking a deep breath, you lost a man that was very close to you. A while ago, your father. I open my eyes to see her mouth hanging open. Yes, she says quietly, even with Tila's hand on her shoulder to amplify her voice. Yes, he died four years ago. I'm so sorry for your loss. I know what it is like to lose a father. I keep my eyes locked on hers, though I desperately want to glare up at the king in his shiny box. A collective gasp echoes through the crowd, amazed that I could no such a personal detail. And they want more. Teela selects person after person to come down into the pit, each one more excited to be read than the last. I spout random and personal things about them, things that a stranger shouldn't know. You just found out you were pregnant. Your father is a blacksmith. You stole the shoes you're wearing. Every time, both the person I read and the crowd above us are in awe. They gasp, clap, and cheer a completely captivated audience. Plagues, if I knew people like this so much, I would have charged for readings on the street. A lanky young man now stands before me, a grin lighting up his face as he stares down expectantly. Closing my eyes, I recall the faint ring of dirt clinging to the right knee of his pants as he walked towards me. That, combined with the subtle outline of a small box in his coat pocket and the happy glow on his face, I come to my conclusion in a matter of seconds. I'm sensing joy, because, I release one of his hands to press my fingers to my temple. You just got engaged, today, I open my eyes just in time to see his mouth fall open. Yes, she's right, I just proposed less than two hours ago. He spins to face the crowd, a wide smile on his face as the audience goes wild. Congratulations. My shout is swallowed by the cheering crowd as he practically skips up the stairs to return to his seat. With that, I spin on my heel and head back to my chair, not waiting for another person to come striding down for me to read. Here, Teela sweeps an arm behind her, gesturing to us, are your contestants for the sixth ever purging trials. Her voice echoes across the stadium only to be quickly drowned out by the crowd. The contestants around me stand, and I do the same. We wave and smile at the crowd, watching as they chant, stomp, and pump their fists in the air. I feel sick. I feel used. This is all a game to them. But if I want to stay alive, I have to play my part. I have to play them. Being a pawn in their game is the price I have to pay to survive. Make them believe I like this, and in turn, they will like me. So I straighten, holding my head a little higher as I smile a little brighter.
I am no one's pawn. Chapter 16. Kai. Baata not do, lto my clothes, staining everything a sickening red. Torturing tends to be a messy occupation, and despite how many years of practice I've had, it never seems to get any easier. Or cleaner. Unlike Kit, who has been trained since childhood to be poised, just, and kingly, my training has consisted of more hands-on work. Battle strategies, assassinations, and the art of torture made up much of my education. And due to this unique and extensive training I've received, I am very good at what I do. Except, it seems, when it comes to the silencer cowering on the dungeon floor before me. It's been days. I've beaten this man to a bloody pulp, and what have I learned in return? Nothing. To say that I'm pissed would be an understatement. The only useful word I've gotten him to slip past his lips, besides the splitting screams and pleas, is what I'm assuming is his name. Micah. I sigh, crouching down to hover over his broken, bloody body. His long hair, matted with blood, falls into his deep brown eyes. They widen when they meet mine, making him look so young. He can't be more than a few years my senior. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I say, deceptively soft, but I don't believe you're mute. I grab his jaw and pry it open to reveal the blood pooling in his mouth, over his tongue, staining his teeth scarlet. But I could easily make that happen. I could carve out your tongue. I drop his head to the stone floor and stand to leave, aware that I'm already late for dinner. Slamming the door to the cell behind me, I offer Damien a curt nod. He gives me a slow bow of his head in return before following me down the long hallway of cells. Our footsteps echo off the stone walls as we make our way up the stairs and into the bright, sun-filled hallway above the dungeons. I deftly head to the throne room even while my mind wanders. The trials are quickly approaching with only four days separating us from the first deadly game. These past few days have followed the same routine of training, eating, talking, and torturing. And well, toying with Peden. She's been my main source of entertainment as of late. She's entertaining, with her wit and stubbornness and obvious annoyance with me. Stop. I push thoughts of Peden from my mind as I stride through the large doors of the throne room. My hands find their way to my pockets, casual despite how very aware I am that my navy shirt splotched with blood does not quite fit the dress code for dinner. The servants have already brought food to the table, which everyone sitting around it is greedily enjoying. Heads turn when they hear my shoes on the polished floor, several pairs of eyes flicking from my face to the blood clinging onto my clothes. I ignore their stares, seeing that I was too tired to change and too hungry to care. Ah. Kai, glad you could make it. Father sounds peeved, per usual, as I take my seat. Honey, mother says quietly, leaning towards me, you look a little, well, bloody. She cringes as her eyes roam over me, assessing her son. Occupational hazard, mother, I give her a small smile, the sweet one I reserve for only her. She nods hesitantly before trying to relax back into her chair. I barely listen to the quiet chatter carrying on around me. I'm air finishing the last of my beans when an incessant tapping has me looking up. Strands of Peden's silver hair fall around her face in loose curls, the rest of it tied back into a messy knot at the nape of her neck. Her eyes are pinned to her plate, her thumb and silver ring tapping a steady beat against the wooden table. And then those ocean eyes slide up to mine. I tip my head towards her drumming thumb. Is there something on your mind, Gray? She looks me over as if noticing my presence for the first time. Is there something on your shirt, Azza? Her eyes skim over my clothes before widening slightly. Is that blood? I'm sure I imagine the flash of worry on her face, the look of concern when she thinks it may be my own blood staining the shirt. Careful, darling. You almost look as if you care. I give her a lazy smile, and she gives me a lazy eye roll. My gaze snaps to mother when her gentle voice cuts through my thoughts. I hope you all have begun pairing up for the first ball. I glance around the table. Only the three who haven't previously lived in the castle look slightly confused. Hera, Ace, and Peden. Haven't grown up watching these balls, haven't even been to a ball. I envy them. 
As is tradition, Mother continues, the contestants will partner up for the balls that are held before each trial. And since there is an odd number of you, whoever does not have a partner will be paired with someone, don't worry. Her smile somehow grows wider as she says, so choose your date and get practicing your dance steps. Kit shifts beside me, and I see him quickly glance in Peden's direction. I run a hand through my hair before turning my attention back on my food, needing to focus on something. Since the girls outnumber the boys, it's likely that Kit will be paired with whoever doesn't have a partner. But that won't stop him from asking one of them if he wishes to. It's clear that Peden intrigues him. But even if Kit wasn't going to ask Peden to accompany him to the ball, which I don't doubt he will, she doesn't want me. I like a challenge but she's made it abundantly clear on what she wishes us to be, competition. Enemies. And more importantly, why isn't that what I want as well? I wake the next morning, drenched in sweat. This isn't uncommon, not with the nightmares that tend to haunt my sleep. But today is different. Today it is bloody boiling outside. It's only dawn, and my room is already sticky with humidity. I roll out of bed and make my way to the bathroom where I splash cool water over my already damp face. It doesn't take me long to get ready, begrudgingly pulling on a white cotton shirt before slipping out the door and... And there she is. She steps out of her room with her head down, quietly shutting the door before looking up and practically jumping at the sight of me. Plagues, Kai, don't scare me like that. I blink. It's the first time she's called me by my name, and I realize then that I could get used to the sound of it rolling off her tongue. She seems to notice what she's said and clears her throat before beginning to walk down the hallway. Aren't you up early for a prince? She calls over her shoulder. What? No breakfast in bed? I catch up to her easily, taking about three strides before I'm walking beside her. If you're not getting breakfast in bed, neither am I. I'm just a regular contestant, remember? No longer a charming prince for the time being. You were never that to begin with. I chuckle as we turn the corner, spotting the kitchen looming just ahead. The smell of biscuits and eggs wafting from within is enough to make me change course. So, Peden begins, probably the start of some snide comment that I'll never get the pleasure of hearing because I grab her wrist and tug her towards the kitchen doors. I'm sure she is just as hungry as I am, and breakfast won't be served for nearly another hour. I'm doing us both a favor. Apparently, Peden doesn't share my sentiment. Her feet dig into the floor at the threshold of the kitchen doors, eyes darting between mine. What are you? She starts, giving me that murderous look I've already grown so familiar with. Shush. I press my finger to her lips lightly and the words die in her throat. I suppose my job will forever be feeding you now, hum, Gray. Her flustered expression has me laughing quietly before I hear the scuff of shoes, reluctantly drawing my gaze from her wide-eyed one. We've drawn quite the crowd. Several servants stand staring at us, taking in the scene before them. But they scuttle away swiftly, snickering as they try to make themselves look busy. Hello, ladies, I call, looking around the room at the blushing servants. I've brought a far more interesting guest today than Kit. I place a gentle hand on the small of Peden's back, prodding her forward. It's a question, a tentative test, an innocent inquiry. Is this okay? I briefly wonder if she's considering breaking my wrist, maybe contemplating placing a dagger to my throat. And then she relaxes, easing into my touch. An answer to my question without uttering a word. Yes. I guide her towards the center of the kitchen where I've spotted Gail, currently hunched over the stove. Morning Gail. She spins around, her face lighting up when she sees me. You look lovely as always. My mouth quirks as I hop up onto the counter and sit beside where she flips crispy pieces of bacon over the stove. You're such a kiss ass, Kai, she teases, lightly whipping a towel in my direction. Her eyes land on Peden and she straightens, nodding curtly. Ah, Miss Peden, a pleasure. Please, Peden sighs with a small smile, no miss. Just Peden. I can practically see Gail relax, probably thanking the plague that formalities aren't needed. Now, 
What is a sweet girl like you doing hanging around riffraff like him? Gail jabs a thumb in my direction while I snatch a strip of bacon from the pan behind her turned back. I let out a low laugh. Oh, sweet isn't the word I would use to describe her, Gail. She held a knife to my throat only a few days ago. He deserved it, Peden says simply, shrugging slightly. Oh, I'm sure he did, Gail replies, grinning at her. I probably would have done the same. She glances at me, nodding towards Peden. I like this one. Peden tips her head back and laughs. My body goes still as I listen to the sound of it fill the kitchen. So warm, so bright. Then, too quickly, she collects herself, clears her throat, and turns towards me. So, you and Kit are close with Gail? My head tilts to the side as I peer down at her, my eyes never straying from hers as I say, inseparable, aren't we Gail? A loud snort escapes the cook. Inseparable indeed. The princes won't leave me alone. Her eyes sparkle with pride when they meet mine. I'm the only reason the two of them aren't stick thin. Ah, yes, I sigh, we have Gail's sticky buns to thank for fattening us up. After Gail gladly informed Peden of some rather embarrassing stories from my childhood, we talk casually, a regular routine for the cook and me. I ask about her son, stationed as a guard near the scorchers, all while sneaking bits of food as she swats at my hands. My gaze snags on Peden from where she watches me curiously, as though trying to puzzle me out. Funny, normally I'm the one giving her that look. I jump off the counter and give Gail a peck on the cheek. Don't miss me too much. Then I turn towards Peden who's leaning casually against the counter, a small smile tugging at her lips. I take a slow step towards her. Her head tips up to look me in the eyes as I close the distance between us, so close I can smell the lingering scent of lavender on her skin. I reach around her back, fingers brushing her tank. Her breath hitches and I feel my lips tug upward. When she opens her mouth to tell me off, I pull my hand back slowly, holding an apple in front of her face. Always feeding you, remember. She stares at the fruit before snatching it from my hand, huffing in annoyance. And then she smiles, the dazzling action lighting up her face as she rubs the apple on my shirt, right above my heart. She takes a bite, her eyes locked with mine. And you said you weren't a gentleman. By the time we make it to the training grounds, I'm slick with sweat once again. Almost in unison, several of us peel off our shirts, unable to bear the heat any longer. Kit and I set off jogging around the grounds at an easy pace. I watch as the contestants pair off to spar or go their separate ways to train. Andy is currently in the form of a red leopard, circling several Sadies in one of the dirt training rings. Unsurprisingly, Braxton is on the ground doing push-ups while Jax occupies himself by throwing rocks as far as he can only to blink and catch them before they hit the ground. Finally, my traitorous eyes slide towards a flash of silver hair. She's beating on that padded tree, per usual. She always does this. Her movements are quick, controlled, channeling an emotion I can't place. She spins suddenly, her arm raising before I see her wrist flick. I blink and a knife sinks deep into a tree ten yards away. Practiced. Purposeful. Precise. But I'm not the only one watching. Kit's gaze is locked on her, almost curiously. I clear my throat and pick up our pace. So, how are you feeling? Kit's head whips towards me. At the moment, tired. I laugh at that, hitting him lightly in the stomach. Yeah, you're getting out of shape, Kitty. He shoves me at the mention of his childhood nickname. Well, I don't exactly have a reason I need to be in shape, do I? Though he says this jokingly, I don't miss the bitter edge in his voice. I sigh, already knowing what this is about. You know why you can't. I have no idea what you're talking about. Like hell you don't, I mutter. Kit, you're the next king of Ilya. We need you alive. The trials are no place for you. Shit. As soon as the words left my mouth, I knew they'd struck him like a physical blow. Is my own kingdom no place for me either? His laugh holds no humor. Hell, is anywhere outside of the castle not safe enough for the air? Kit. I know, he cuts me off, taking a deep breath. I know our duties are different. They always will be. 
I just wish mine weren't so damn boring. With that, he shoots me a weak smile in an effort to lighten the mood. I watch him, waiting to see if he'll say what we both know he wants to, waiting to see if he'll tell me that he feels trapped, that he feels like he's constantly trying to prove himself, that he wishes he were in the trials so he could do just that. But he says nothing of the sort, his smile a silent plea to return to just being brothers and not the future king and his enforcer. So, for him, I force a grin onto my face. Well, at least I can count on your vote in the trials. The tension seems to melt from Kit's body, his smile displaying his emotions like it always has. He sighs in relief at the change in topic before saying, Oh, I don't know that you can count on my vote after you all but called me fat a few minutes ago, Kai Pai. I hate that nickname, and the asshole knows it. So, I stick out my foot, sending Ilya's next king sprawling to the ground before he drags me with him. We finish off our laps, dripping in sweat as the sun beats down on us. I stretch quickly before heading into the ring with Kit. We dance around each other, using both our powers and bodies to fight. Falling into a familiar rhythm, I let myself mull over what Kit had said, losing myself in my thoughts. The world flips. No, I flip. And then I'm sprawled on my back, trying to suck air into my screaming lungs. Damn it. Lost my focus. Got you on the ground, Kai. Kit smiles down at me. Been a few years since that last happened, huh? I can tell is about to continue gloating, so I don't give him the chance. My leg sweeps out, catching his ankles and sending him sprawling to the ground beside me. Don't get used to it, I say, resting my head on the ground and smiling up at the sky. Once he catches his breath, he's barking out a laugh. I should have seen that coming, he trails off as I reluctantly stand to my feet and lazily brush the dirt from my clothes before offering a hand to him. We go our separate ways, Kit to spar with an insisting glare, while I head to the targets. I grab the thin knives from the rack beside me and flip one in my hand before flipping it through the air. Weapons. Fighting. Killing. This was what I was raised to do. This is why I'll be the enforcer and the one fighting in the trials, not Kit. I hear the pounding of fists and quiet panting a few yards to my left, where the padded trees border the training grounds. She's back at it. Once again, she's hammering blows into the tree. Or maybe she simply never stopped in the first place. She looks frustrated, angry, sloppy. Her punches are weaker, her form far less controlled. She's tired and her stance is suffering because of it. I mindlessly flip a knife in my hand, shaking my head at the sky for what I'm about to do. I send my blade cutting through the air towards the target before strolling over to her, coming from behind while she continues to strike the pads. I'm standing at her back now and... She pivots in one swift move, sending an elbow flying towards my face. I barely have enough time to dodge before gripping her arm, halting it in the air. Her head whips around, strands of silver hair sticking to her face, now slick with sweat. My lips twitch into a smile. You should keep practicing before you try to hit me. She snorts. In case you've forgotten how I saved you, I know how to fight. I don't need to try to hit you, Prince. She tugs her arm out of my grip and turns back towards the tree, intently ignoring me. Well that just won't do. With that form, you will need to try, Grey. Oh, really? I can't tell if she's amused or contemplating trying to hit me at this very moment. Maybe both. Yes, really. You're sloppy. It's not like you, I state, making her scoff. Once again, she turns back to the tree and begins throwing more punches, decidedly done with our conversation. Her knuckles are red, raw, and nearly bleeding. Why does she do this to herself? I shake my head, already knowing the answer. Because I've done it before. I've hit pads, walls, anything until blood dripped from my fists. All to find a release for the anger, the frustration, that was pent up inside of me. And that is exactly what Peden is doing. She's still swinging too much with her arms, rather than using her whole body as momentum. She's typically very technical when it comes to fighting, making this especially unlike her. But she's tired and frustrated. 
And despite me knowing all this, I can't fight the urge to toy with her. I step even closer to her back and place my hands on her hips, twisting her body as she throws another punch. She jumps and stumbles into me, her head tipping back against my bare chest. Stop swinging with your arms and swing with your whole body, I say, bending my head so I'm close to her ear. She sucks in a breath when my hand sweeps over her abdomen, the whisper of my fingers dancing. Along her thin tank, engage your core, gray. Her chest heaves, then she takes a step forward, the heat of her body leaving mine. My hands are still planted on her hips when she turns her head to shoot me an irritated look. She knows I'm right, and she hates it. She got lazy and didn't realize until now, too focused and frustrated to notice. The thought has me smiling down at her as she huffs, blowing a strand of hair out of her eyes before turning back towards the tree. Now, throw a punch, I murmur, leaning in to add, correctly. Shockingly, she doesn't argue, likely realizing it won't do her any good. She squares her shoulders and bounces on the balls of her feet. Then she jabs, her fist flying towards the mat as I twist her hips in time with the punch. There's far more momentum behind it, and I can see how much stronger she's gotten in her short time here with consistent meals and training. When her knuckles sink into the pad, the lean muscles in her back and arms are evident. Much better, I say dully, despite being impressed. After a moment that was most definitely too long, I finally drop my hands from her hips. Now, do it on your own. Just to make sure you were paying attention. She stills facing the tree. And then there's a flash of silver hair as she swivels around, throwing a beautiful jab at my face. Chapter 17. I. Kai. T-A-O-A-O-A -A 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 in time. Only years of fighting allow my reflexes to react so quickly. How was that? She says sweetly, flashing that startling smile at me. I huff out a laugh. What if I didn't duck, Gray? I knew you'd duck, as a She's close to my face now, a wicked smile curving her lips when she repeats the exact phrase I told her after throwing a knife in her direction. Looks like someone is itching for a fight. My eyes flick up her body, taking my time. Taking in her stance on the balls of her feet, her slightly raised hands, and every stitch of clothing clinging to her body in between. I've just been waiting for an excuse to punch that smirk off your face. She swings at me again, knowing I'll duck under it. She's toying with me. Wouldn't be the first time someone said that to me, I say as we circle each other. We've backed into a small opening between the targets and the weapons rack opposite them. I show her my palms, surrendering before the fight has even begun. You don't really want to do this and neither do I. Especially because I wouldn't want to mess up that pretty face of yours, darling. She all but rolls her eyes at me. That's funny because I won't hesitate to mess up your pretty face. I smirk. I knew you thought I was pretty. At that, she throws another punch at my face that I easily evade. We continue circling each other, slowly. Damp hair clings to my forehead and I comb my fingers through it, pushing it off my sticky skin. You do know that I have eight powers at my disposal right now, and any one of them could drop you. I grin as I say it, watching as her eyes narrow. I don't want to fight your power, I want to fight you. Just you. Her piercing gaze never leaves mine as she says it, even as the other. Elites turn their attention towards us, finding this fight far more interesting than their training. So, you just want me? No powers? Yes, I just want you, she breathes, annoyed with me. My mouth twists into a crooked grin. I knew you wanted me, Gray. And with that little comment, a high kick comes flying towards my face. I block it with my hands and push her leg down, once again surprised by her strength. Before I can take another breath, a beautiful jab heads for my face, this one intended to meet its mark, hard. I duck under it before grabbing her outstretched wrist and pulling her back against my chest as I twist her arm under her shoulder blade. You're going to have to do better than that, Gray, I whisper against her ear, smiling. She grunts and drives the elbow of her free arm into my stomach. The air whooshes out of my lungs, and she takes advantage of it. 
pivoting, she swings her elbow high at my face, making my head snap to the side when it connects with my jaw. My grip on her arm loosens, and she spins out of my hold before throwing a right cross at the exact same spot on my jaw. Damn. I keep my head turned to the side, my tongue roaming over the inside of my cheek as my mouth begins to fill with blood. And then my gaze slowly slides to her. She's on the balls of her feet, hands still raised in a fighting stance as she stares at me. And then she smiles, momentarily distracting me. I laugh, deep and quiet before spitting blood onto the ground. Much better, Gray. I smile as I circle her, my fists instinctively raising. I might actually need to fight back. Her smile slips before she's suddenly dropping to the ground and sweeping her leg in a wide arc, intending to knock me to the dirt. I jump over it swiftly but she's back on her feet in a split second, throwing a combination of punches. She peppers me with a series of uppercuts, jabs, and hooks, but I stay on defense, blocking her fists. With her quick movements, she finally gets in a sharp blow to my stomach, stealing my breath away. Fine, if she wants me to fight, I'll fight. I won't hurt her, badly. In fact, she's quite skilled, and despite my mocking, she is a fine fighter. But with my now bruising jaw and stomach, I'm done playing games. She ducks before my fist meets the air where her head was. Then she kicks out a leg, swinging it towards my ribs. I grab her ankle right before it connects with my side and yank her forward. She stumbles towards me, and I grip her thigh against my side with one hand, while the other lands a blow to her cheekbone. It was a softer hit, but still hard enough to make her head snap to the side. I let go of her leg at the same moment I wrap my foot behind her ankle still planted on the ground, giving it a good tug. She falls, hard, violent coughs shake her body as soon as her back hits the dirt as she tries to suck air back into her lungs. I hover over her with a smile, assuming the match is over. Wrong. She kicks me in the groin. Hard. I double over, huffing out a pained laugh. Cheap shot, darling. Yes, but an effective one. She jumps to her feet, panting even with a sly smile. Her hands are up, covering her face, while the rest of her body is covered in dirt. And then we are trading off blows and blocks as we toy with one another. It's like a dance, and she is a fierce partner. But for whatever reason, I refuse to throw my whole weight behind the punches. I rein myself in, not enough to stop me from fighting back, but enough to keep her mostly unbroken. Though she is clearly not doing the same. She's hitting hard, striking relentlessly, wanting to hurt me. One minute we're flirting and the next we're fighting, possibly even both at the same time. I can't seem to figure this vicious girl out. After minutes of blocking and landing blows, we are both panting in the unbearable heat. Sweat rolls down my brow and stings my eyes as the group surrounding us cheers and grunts each time one of us takes a hit. I strike her with a combination of punches, my uppercut f ending its mark under her jaw and jerking her head up. I follow it with a lazy jab which she dodges, grabbing my outstretched arm in one hand, and my opposite shoulder in the other. Then she steps close to me, driving a knee into my stomach. But she's left the arm that is holding my shoulder open and exposed, so I take advantage of it. I use both hands to grab hold of her forearm and wrist before pivoting so my back is against her chest. Then I use my momentum to raise her off the ground, throwing her over my shoulder and onto the dirt with a thud. She's on her back, wheezing from the impact of the hard ground as I stare down at her, hoping she's finally given up. Wrong again. With surprising speed, she grips the back of my ankles with her hands and yanks with that strength of hers. Caught off guard, she manages to pull my feet from under me, sending the ground flying towards my back. She's up and on me in a second, practically jumping on top of my chest, placing her knees on either side of me. And then she cocks her bloody fist back, her smile triumphant. I take her in, bloody and straddling me. If it weren't for my current situation, I glance at her fist still posed to strike, this could be a lot more fun, I say quietly, looking her up and down before staring into those blue eyes as they widen. Her focus slips for a moment. Perfect. I grab her waist and flip us over. 
Now I'm on top of her, pinning her wrists into the dirt beside her head. She pants beneath me, glaring up into my face. She's covered in dirt, and I'm certain I look no different. A dark bruise is already beginning to blossom across her cheekbone, and blood leaks from her nose and mouth. Nicely done, Gray, I say, close to her face. She squirms in my hold, but it does nothing to loosen my grip. I have a few critiques. She stills, and I watch as a slow smile spreads across her lips. Seeing that you're the future enforcer, I wasn't sure if you were capable of showing mercy. Clearly, you are. I stare down at her, my face morphing into its cold mask at her words. Then she lifts her head off the ground so only mere inches separate us as she breathes, I know you went easy on me. Was it that obvious or did her psychic abilities tell her that? My gaze roams over her face, snagging on the dirt and blood splattering her skin, concealing the faint dusting of freckles I know covers her nose. And what makes you think that? Her face inches impossibly closer, lashes fluttering, lips quirked into a smile and dangerously close to my own. Her voice is breathy, barely audible as she whispers, because if you weren't going easy on me, I wouldn't be able to do this. I barely have enough time to be confused before she headbutts me. When the crown of her head meets my nose, I see stars. She breaks my hold on her wrists and uses both legs to push me off her. A cloud of dust surrounds me as I lay in the dirt, blinking away the throbbing pain. The hit was hard but not hard enough to stop me from staggering to my feet and facing her, blood streaming from my broken nose. She doesn't waste a moment. Her arms are around my neck, her knee driving into my stomach again and again. Before I have time to react, she uses my bent leg as a step stool, throwing her own legs over my shoulders in one swift movement. Using her momentum and the limbs wrapped around me, she throws us both to the ground. I sprawl into the dirt while she rolls, wasting no time before pouncing on me. And then my arms are pinned under her knees once again. How was my form, Prince? She pants, lips bloody. Any critiques? Now. Her weight presses down on me and I huff out a laugh. I have a few notes. Likewise, her hand flashes to her boot, sliding a thin blade from the worn leather. For starters, I don't appreciate my opponents going easy on me. She gently drags the knife's tip across my cheekbone, tickling my skin. I smirk despite the blade she trails across my face, my gaze burning into hers. And then my eyes flick to the blood dribbling down her face, leaking from the several cuts and gashes I'd given her. Looks like I messed up your pretty face after all, despite my best efforts. Oh, this is nothing. She laughs breathlessly. You should see the damage I did to your pretty face. My lips quirk into a smile as I lift my head towards hers. Oh, darling, as long as you still think I'm pretty, I don't give a damn what I look like. Those blue eyes blink at me in shock before rolling at me in annoyance. With a huff, she shifts and stands to her feet. I follow, dusting the dirt from my body as she does the same. Before she can turn and leave, I say, you're far more fun to spar with than Kit. We should do that again sometime. Her head tilts slightly to the side, her smile sly. I'll never pass up the chance to kick your ass, Prince. And with that, she's striding away as I watch her retreating form. Oh, and Kai, she calls, her voice casual. And then I'm ducking. She spun throwing the knife so suddenly that I barely had time to dodge before it sank into the wooden target a few feet behind me. I don't want your mercy. Next time we fight, I can see her blue eyes smoldering from where I stand, impress me. A low whistle sounds from the crowd, Kit, of course. Ignoring him, I shake my head, grinning at her as she turns away from me. Vicious, little thing, indeed. 